This is Brian Jakovich, and welcome to Stelgen Screencasts. Building upon the last week's uh, episode on the introduction to CloudFormation, I'm going to go into the more advanced features that CloudFormation offers you, specifically around the EC2 instance resource. So inside the EC2 instance, there's a resource called CloudFormation Init. CloudFormation init is an AWS AMI resource for configuring EC2 instances. You can use CloudFormation to install packages, to download and extract zip files, tars, download files, dynamically build files, create users, create groups. You have a lot of flexibility with, with CloudFormation. It gives you the ability to really configure your the internals of your EC2 instance, where you can do the complete setup in a scripted form this would be inside your template. So now that I've gone over a little, a little bit about CloudFormation, let's get into the actual resource and then how do you interact with it. To use CloudFormation init, you go into your metadata and you create an AWS CloudFormation init section. Inside there you can have uh, multiple configurations in this particular template. We only have one configuration. And inside configuration, you define a bunch of resources that you want to install or build or uh, download. So here, I'm using the packages, and then I'm using Yum. There's a list of multiple package management tools that you can use inside packages. A few of them are like Yum, AppGet, uh, RubyGems. There's, there's a lot of way to download packages from your package repository. So here I'm using yum to install GCC, C++, Automake, AutoConf. As you see I have an empty box. Inside this box you define which version of the particular package you want to install. Because I'm leaving it empty that means that I want the latest and greatest. Just pull, pull the package out and whatever the latest is, is that's what I want to build. But I can also define a particular version that I want. So let's say I want version 1.5.6 of GCC. I don't know if that's actually one, but I'm just gonna throw a number out there. What I would do is I'd put 1.5.6 in here and it would download that particular version. This is most used with uh, RubyGems. So if I had an additional section called RubyGems and then let's say Chef 11.4.4 and this would down, download 11.4.4. This is really useful because generally whenever I'm specifying gems inside my infrastructure code, I want to put a version so that this can continuously build until I want to upgrade that version. But for this particular screencast, we're installing Chef a different way. Next, I have sources. Sources are used to download a particular zip or a tar file and then extract them into your specified location. So here, um, specifying Etsy Chef as my directory and I'm downloading this cookbook zip file. This turns out to be a top level of cookbooks and then inside the cookbooks directory are a set of recipes. So basically what will happen after running this is there will be an Etsy Chef cookbooks directory and inside that we'll have all the uh, content from my cookbooks.zip. Okay, moving on, the files the bottom section I'm downloading a particular file from my S3 bucket and then I'm saying the mode and the owner and the group so this is this is tip, just your typical download file similar to like a wget but up here it's a little bit different I am creating a file and then specifying the content I want inside so here I will be creating a file etsychefsolo.rb and inside I will have these lines of code minus the quotes and everything. So this is great if I want to reference other resources inside my file. If let's say I want to reference a parameter and up here I have a parameter called key name. What I'll do is I will add the reference inside my file. So this would be ref Colon. And what will happen is you'll see file cache path, file that join, this line of code, 
and then appended to it will be my key name. So there would be also a space here. So this would be a space between this line and this line. But since I don't want this in this particular file, I'm going to delete it. But I just wanted to make a note of you can use the other resources that you're being built in your CloudFormation template inside files, which I find the most benefit of the file section. So next we have some typical group and user management. This will just create a, a group one and group two instead of the group ID. There's other parameters that you can give this, but for this particular example, I'm only saying the uh, group ID to 45. Next, I'm creating a user. I'm assigning it to the group, and then I'm also adding a user ID and a home path. So this is just your typical, you know, if you want to create a, a specific user, maybe a deploy user or whatever is specific to your particular infrastructure. Next, I have commands. So this is a way for you to run arbitrary commands on your instance. With commands, you're able to do other configuration as to where you want your command to run. So like, for instance, in this one, I am running, uh, I'm changing into Etsy before I run my command right here, which is good. So rather than having like two lines of bash code, like CD into Etsy, and then running, where it could potentially be a problem, maybe a timeout or something. The command deals with that right here. So it's a little more powerful than just, just running straight bash. And then next I am doing uh, uh, the chef solo run. Basically what this does, it just runs chef solo and passes in the solo.js and solo.rb to configure the run and then I'm changing into a, uh, the SE Chef directory. Lastly, we have services. And remember I was referencing the uh, HTTPD package that I was building? Well, down here, I am saying the ser uh, start, starting the service. I'm setting it to true and then making sure it r it's running. So it will, it will start the service. So this gives you a lot of power to executing particular tasks that you want. Uh, there is an execution order, so packages run first, sources run second, files run third, and then groups and users run, followed by commands and services. So I'm pretty sure this is in the correct order as to the, the running of uh, execution order, but you can just go to the Amazon docs if you have a particular execution order that you need. So why that would be important is you would, I wouldn't want chef to run if my chef package hasn't been installed. So it also takes away some of the flexibility you might want. In this particular uh, set of code, I want to install Ruby 19 Devel before I do anything else. So I am having to, instead of using commands, I have to just basically script this in, into straight bash. So that's inside user data is where you, where you do it. Basically user data, you can create your own bash file that will run at the startup of your instance. So what I'm doing is I'm updating the bootstrap, basically doing the installation of Ruby 1.9.3. And then I'm doing the installation of Chef right here. So all this is done before CloudFormation init is called upon. Because CloudFormation init is called right here when I do opt AWS bin CFN init and then pass in the resource to do this on. All the, so all the pre-work is done here and then CloudFormation it is called. Now that I've explained a little bit about how CloudFormation works and, and the various resources, I'm now gonna, we're now gonna do a run of CloudFormation and see what builds. So at the end of the run, I should see that all these packages are, packages are installed. I'm just gonna check to see if uh, Apache is installed. And then there should be a cookbooks directory in Etsy Chef, and then inside cookbooks, solo RB, solo JS file, a new user, a new group, and then Chef Solo should have run. And what that will do is it will download Git. So if it all works as as expected, we should have Git. All right. So now I'm going to go over to my CloudFormation section, create stack, episode two. I'm going to upload my template.
and I'm going to give my key name, so it's just BSJ. Name. Okay, now our cloud permission stack is complete. Now I'm going to go into the EC2 instance and confirm that everything that we thought was installed and configured actually was. So there should be a chef uh, directory. And there is, yep, we have the solo JS, solo RB, and the cookbooks. This cache directory is created whenever chef solo is run, so my best guess is the chef solo run was at least initiated. We can confirm that everything got installed in a second. Yeah, inside all the cookbooks that I was expecting to see. Now let's see if git was installed. Yep, git was installed. So that means the chef, the chef solo uh, run actually did complete and looks to be successful. We can now go and check to see the logs of the Chef Solo or not exactly, not necessarily Chef Solo, but the whole entire CloudFormation init uh, run. So we cd var log and then this is where we see that the service and stuff were, was started. This gives you a full list of the cloud permission it that particular uh, stuff that was run. So, for instance, the commands were run, the user was created, the group was created, the yum installed all the patches we expected, and the uh, patch was uh, started successfully. So, it looks based upon what what ran here. It looks like cloud permission was successful, and the cloud permission init did configure our system as we thought it would. Um, the last thing that we can look at is the creation of the file. So we can go to SC Chef. We cat solo RB. And there we go, we have the files built out the way we expected it to. So as Cloud Permission Init, it's a really good resource for scripting your environments in line with your template. Now, the next step, assuming you want to continue and further extend scripting your, your infrastructure and environments, would be to actually use Chef to do most, if all the work. Now, CloudFormation init that was used in this particular screencast installs Chef and configures Chef so that it can run and, and do other things. Like, the only thing Chef did in this particular CloudFormation template is install git. But in your typical infrastructure, you could install anything else using Chef. Or, if you don't want to go down the Chef path, you could actually use the CloudFormation init to do all the, the building of the installation, the commands. You could put it all into CloudFormation init. Generally, the recommendation is to use an infrastructure scripting tool like Chef or Puppet. But if you really feel inclined to do so, you could do it in CloudFormation init. So the best use cases for CloudFormation Init are to install all of the configuration and installation of packages to get your actual scripting infrastructure, your infrastructure scripting tool working. So in this particular screencast, I installed Chef. I did everything I needed to do to do the bare minimum to install Chef. And anything after that, I would have Chef install. If you want to learn more about CloudFormation, CloudFormation Init, you can go to the AWS CloudFormation Init user guide. Inside there, CloudFormation Init is covered extensively. Everything you need to know is in there, and along with plenty of examples.